כן. So uh, we'll begin by reading uh, chapter 10 of the Bhagavad Gita, text number 25. Um, we do not have it on the board, but I'll just read it. And then we'll say, read something of the purple, then we will get into uh, the main substance of the presentation. So this is Bhagavad Gita, this is 1025. And this is Krishna speaking to Arjun. Mahashinam Brugu Aham Giram As Giram As Miekam Aksharam Yagyanam Japa Yagnosmi Stavaranam Himalayaha. Okay. Please repeat after me. Maharishinam Among the great sages. Brigu Hu Brigu. Aham, Aham, I am, I am. Giram, Giram of vibrations. vibrations. Asmi, Asmi, I am. I am. Ekam, Aksharam, Ekam Aksharam, Pranava. Pranava. I should, let me say that again. Ekam Aksharam, Ekam Aksharam Pranava. Pranava. Yagyanam. Of sacrifices. <coughs> Japayagnehe. Chanting. Asmi. I am. Stavaranam. Of immovable things. Himalayaha. The Himalayan mountains. Translation in purple by His Divine Grace. Shulei Si Bhaktivedanta Swami Shila Prabhupada Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Of the great sages I am Brigu Of vibrations I am the transcendental Om Of sacrifices I am the chanting of the holy names Japa And of immovable things I am the Himalayas Purple This is 1025 Okay Purple Brahma, the first living creature within the universe, created sev several suns for the propagation of various kinds of species. Among these suns, Brigu is the most powerful sage. Of all the transcendental vibrations, the Om, Omkara, represents Krishna. Of all sacrifices, the chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, is the purest representation of Krishna. Sometimes animal sacrifices are recommended, but in the sacrifice of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, there is no question of violence. It is the simplest and the purest. Whatever is sublime in the world is a representation of Krishna. Therefore, the Himalayas, the greatest mountains in the world, also represent Him. The mountain named Meru was mentioned in the previous verse, but Meru is sometimes movable, whereas the Himalayas are never movable. Thus, the Himalayas are greater than Meru. Okay. Sorry? Meru. It's Meru. Okay, so please repeat after me of the great sages. I am Brigu. Of vibrations, I am the transcendental Om. Of sacrifices, I am the chanting of the holy names, Japa. And of immovable things, I am the Himalayas. Okay. Shri Chaitanya Manopishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagujatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tom Sijiva 
Sadvaitam Savadutam Virjana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Rishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpaturubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyevacha Patita Nam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we begin by begging the blessings of His Holiness John Willie Maharaj. Suspicious presence can uh, make everything auspicious. And also we beg your blessings as Vaishnavas, Vaishnavis, um, so we can say something that will be pleasing to the Guru Prampara on this particular topic. So, let's see how, how we can frame this. So we are engaged in this, in this activity. Our sacrifices and the chanting of the holy names. And Prabhupada in this purple is saying, the, um, of all sacrifices, the chanting is the purest representation of Krishna. Uh, being part of a, of a spiritual community is a very interesting thing. It is a great blessing, um, but also how we, how we engage in, in that activity of being part of the community also presents some challenges. One subtle challenge is when we take things for granted and take the, and take the process mechanically. So... There is an emphasis, a, a tremendous emphasis by Srila Prabhupada, by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, by all the Vedas ultimately on this chanting of the holy names. And because there is an emphasis, therefore this is repeated. And the repetition is meant to establish the supremacy of something. Uh, Prabhupada will sometimes say this in relation to this verse, Harinama, Harinama, Harinam, Eva Kevalam, Kalo, Nasti, Eva, Nasti, Eva, Nasti, Eva, Katiya, and Yata. It is stated three times to make it a categorical. Okay. The downside, from our perspective, is when something is repeated again and again, if, if, the, if the depth of that message is not caught, then it becomes a cliché. Yeah. A cliche means it's something that you hear all the time, so it literally becomes forgotten, or the significance of it becomes forgotten. So you, you hear you're not the body. Yes, yes, I've heard that before. Tell me something different. Or you hear the chanting of the holy names is the most important. Yes, yes, I've heard that before, so tell me something different. And it can become, uh, yeah, as we said, a mechanical practice. So with these seminars that Marge is doing and the emphasis given by our, our leaders in our movement, it is one of the benefits is to bring this back into conscious awareness. So it doesn't become mechanical. So we remember what we are doing, why we are doing it. And therefore, within our tradition, there is such a wealth of teachings about how to chant. Yeah. There's so many different instructions about how to chant, so many things given by Srila Prabhupada. I was very very inspired by the prayers that Marge gave yesterday. I mean, really wonderful prayers to the, to the beads, prayers to the Lord. The other side of it is that because there's so much, it can become somewhat bewildering. So with this exploration today, it is, just the, the, it is literally a step in a journey. It, and it is a journey that we've all probably begun, hopefully. And that is that in Krishna consciousness, we are personalists. We are transcendental personalists. Therefore, in our practice of Krishna consciousness, it can be greatly inspired and enhanced 
the more that we make that practice also personal. So many instructions are given about how we can chant. And what we're trying to, or the essential thing we're trying to encourage in this seminar is to really try to, to deepen and change the quality of our relationship with the Holy Name. The first thing to understand is that it is a relationship. Yeah? Krishna, in the form of His Holy Name, personally is reciprocating with everyone based upon the quality of our endeavor, the quality of our chanting. Uh, my wife attended the seminar by Chandra Mulli Maharaj in, in London and she was so enlivened by it. And I think Maharaj made the point there also and I heard him make it yesterday that even the attentiveness is a gift. But we have to endeavor for that particular gift. At the same time, we've all come in with different types of samskars from a previous life. We've all come in with different levels of Sukriti from previous lives. So all of us have our individual journey to the same destination. Yeah. And, and if you think about this, you, you, can, you can see this. You can see that there are some devotees, they struggle with some aspect of spiritual life that you find easy. Right? Have you ever had that experience? And you think, why can't they just get it together in this area? You know, Some devotees, I remember hearing my, my spiritual master explain that Different, different devotees will have different challenges. Some devotees in their previous life, they were yogis. So they very much loved being on their own. You know? and, and meditating on their own. And their struggle comes when they have to interact in the community with other devotees. Because that is something that is a little bit more new to them, a little bit more foreign. For some devotees, that is not an issue. For some devotees, they love being around other people. They get their energy from others. But their difficulty is being regulated. Yeah? So everyone will have their different challenges because we all come in with different um, karma, different samskars. But the other side is that there will be something that we carry that can help us in our journey. Yeah? We will each have something that we carry and there will be there'll be some aspects of the approach towards the Holy Name which will have more of an enlivening effect for some than for others. Although all of them are powerful. Yeah? But because of the modes that we have, uh, we were explaining yesterday how Prabhupada says the ninefold process of hearing and chanting, etc., it can be done in different modes. I think it's in third canto, Bhagavatam, and Prabhupada explains that. And it's also explained that each of those have also sub-modes. So you can actually go on. There's many combinations of that. So what, what we want to encourage in this time that we have together, and we'll do a few different things, we've got some handouts as well, is we want to encourage you to try to really, really try to do something that we don't do so well in our movement. I was going to give a seminar, I'm still working on it, called Seven Habits of Highly Effective Devotees. And I was reflecting on some wonderful, I mean, Marge is an ocean of realization. You know, some wonderful points that Marge has made over the years in different seminars. And that one of the things that we see, it was, Marge was explaining many times that if we have the mood that we just have to finish our 16 rounds, he said, then you'll never become a serious chanter of the holy names. Yeah. And it was a really powerful point. And I was trying to reflect on what Marge was saying. And a few things came to mind. Because I, 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 I shared the point with, at, in London with a group of devotees. We were doing some, some discussions on the chanting. And there was some agitation. One of them made the point after one of the exercises we're going to do today. He said, but we have to because you know, we have so many other things to do, etc., etc. And it got me thinking how also the chanting, especially in our beginning stages, also um, is going to be accessed based upon how we arrange our lives so that we can actually chant properly. Yeah? In other words, if there's a lot of passion, it sometimes can interfere with our ability to sit down and really give our minds to the chanting. In this respect, I, I also recall a seminar, no, it was a class, it was a morning class given by His Holiness to Mal Krishna Maharaj. This was in London, 
on Radhastami, 1999. And he said that he feels that practically everyone who comes to our movement has the ability to make it all the way in terms of Krishna consciousness. He said, but in many cases we don't. And he, and he said something which I really, which always left an impression in my mind. He said, but in many cases that we don't. He said, I don't think it's because they get the, um, the devotees get the chant. Um, he said, I don't think it's because the devotees get the chanting wrong. He said, however, when the devotees aren't correctly situated, their minds become disturbed, and that's what makes the chanting difficult. So when we chant Hare Krishna, the ability to access the holy name is enhanced by being in a mindset which helps us to understand what we are doing. So the chanting is also going to be connected to the way that we are living and the modes, the modes that we are allowing to come upon us. When the society is very much in the mode of passion or the mode of ignorance, one of the things that's lost is reflective thinking. A society which is too much running around, just trying to get stuff done, then we hear but we don't hear. Pasyana pina pashiti. So we hear the scriptures but we don't really hear it because I'm thinking about something else to do. Jai shushi pancha tattva ki jai. Shushi goni tai ki jai. Shushi she grew up from Prague. So what we want to do is try to reverse that. And one of the ways to reverse that is to, is to remember the four stages that we're meant to be considering in our spiritual life. So I'll go through those four. And then also what we're going to try and do in the seminar is make it very interactive and very reflective. Okay, as I said, it's just a step on the journey. But the idea behind this is uh, we want you to try and really think what helps you to chant attentively, okay? What different approaches to the holy name that are given by our acharyas? What particular circumstances help us to chant attentively? We know that that's the goal. We know that the goal is to chant Shudanam. We know the goal is to call out the names of the Lord. As Prabhupada said, as Maharaj repeated yesterday, to chant like a, like a child calling for their mother. Okay? How are we going to make this journey to really develop a relationship with the Holy Name? A strong relationship to the point that when we chant, we really feel enlivened by the chanting and we really relish the chanting of the Holy Names of the Lord. Okay? That's what we're trying to achieve. So the four stages in terms of really trying to imbibe something, really trying to imbibe something, is first Shravana. So we read from third canto, and there's a point that Prabhupada made in that purport, I think well, the verse we read yesterday, and Prabhupada was saying that knowledge begins by hearing. Okay? So the first stage is Shravana. But the difficulty that we have is often that that's where it ends for us. And that is a problem. Yeah. The second stage is manana. So with Maharaj's classes, everything that we read, we want to really think about it. What does this mean? What is Krishna? What is Prabhupada? What are they trying to say? When we, when we start to go on this journey, it starts to leave impressions in our mind. Yeah? Ultimately, our entire process is to reform the, the consciousness and to bring it back to Krishna consciousness. Cheto, Dapana, Marjanam, to cleanse this mind. So the second stage is we've heard something, but now we have to actually think about what I've heard. You know, what, does this actually, what does this actually mean? What is being said about the holy name? And we'll do a little reflection on one of the verses that Maharaj mentioned yesterday because if we if we look at this carefully you'll feel a very you'll feel a shift you'll feel something different about about our teachings the first stage is we try to test drive something so we pull it into practice so i actually do it and i get a feel for what it's like to do this now um there's a fourth stage that's sometimes mentioned and that's vandana because with all of our endeavor we endeavor to hear, we endeavor to meditate, we endeavor to apply. But for the perfection of all things in spiritual life, we need the mercy. And so we are calling out to the Lord, please, I'm going to try 
But ultimately, unless you give your mercy to me, I'm not going to be able to do this. So please be merciful unto me. Please see my endeavor and please bless me with the perfection of that endeavor. So Shravana Manana Nididyasana Vandanam. Okay? So as we go through the rest of the seminar, we really want to encourage you to think about what this means for you. Yeah, we'll see. I'm, I'm conscious of time. I'm going to make sure I finish at 9 o'clock and that's a promise. That's no problem. And like I said, the, the essential thing is to make the journey. We're going to start by reading. Yeah. I'm just going to read one of these verses from the handout that Marge gave us yesterday. And don't worry if you can't see it, but what we want you to do is hear. Okay? What we want you to do is hear what we're actually saying. And then we're going to have a reflective discussion on this, on one of these wonderful verses. Let me just see if there's something else I'm going to take. Okay. So we'll just do this one. So I came across this verse in a, in a, um, in a Japa seminar. It was a handout also um, that Sachin Anamaj gave. And when I looked at it, I thought, this is absolutely amazing. You know? And, and, I, and I did an exercise with the devotees there, just looking at this verse and just taking it very slowly and reflecting on what's actually being said. Because if we do this, if we slow down and go a bit deeper, what happens is, in terms of consciousness, it leaves more of an impression in the consciousness. So I was speaking to one devotee who was born in the movement, and they were talking about some of the Guru Kulis. And they were talking about how why some of the Guru Kulis don't practice sadhana. And they, they said, and they gave an example of one of their relatives who was also born in the movement. And they said that this person went to Gurukul. And when, when he did something wrong, the punishment that he was given is he was told, you have to go and stand in the corner and chant. Yeah, very unfortunate. Yeah, so what happened? Yeah, exactly. Really bad mistake. So what happened was it created a negative emotional anchor in his mind. He loves Kirtan. Interestingly enough, but the Japa, when he goes to chant, because it, it, it's, it's this impression of being given the chanting, of the Japa as a, as a punishment. And it's interesting that how we practice our Japa also leaves a certain anchor. The more we create in circumstances where we chant, especially like this morning when we're chanting with the devotees, with Tulsi, before the deities, in a, in a very wonderful environment, you leave a, a strong positive anchor in the chanting, a relationship. When you think back to the chanting, you remember, oh, peaceful, morning time, blissful, association, it leaves a very strong positive impression which then spurs us or inspires us more to get into that more and more. Of course, the danger is the opposite. If we're always, and, and I've been guilty of this, if we're always chanting and we're between things and it's something I've got to get done and, and, it, and it's something I've, got, I've got a million other things to do, what's the impression that we leave in our consciousness with regards to the chanting? It's, it becomes a disturbance or it's stressful. Yeah? Can anyone relate to that? Yeah? So as we go on this journey, please think about this. Without meaning to, what many of us have done in our movement is we've created negative anchors, negative emotional associations to the chanting. And because we've done that, that is why our chanting is sometimes difficult, or that is why the chanting is something that we, we kind of just try and get done or try and get away but we need to reverse that process and the prayers the sanghas all of these things are to reverse the process because the chanting objectively is blissful but if we cover it with a mundane consciousness we won't understand what it really is yeah so behind this is a second point ah let's stop there and let's do this as a reflective exercise let's just stop there I want you to think about yourselves personally. When you, and, and this is something I'm going to ask you to write down or make a mental note of, you do not have to share this with anyone else. But, but if we're going to transform and improve our chanting, we have to begin by, by acknowledging where we are. 
That is one of the reasons why humility is so powerful. Because when we're humble, we just see, yes, I'm fallen, I do this wrong, I do that wrong, I do this wrong. It's not to, it's not to make us feel bad, but it's to recognize our actual position so we can take the next step forward. So for your reflection, I'm just going to give you literally one or two minutes. I want you to write down or note down or think. Honestly speaking, when you, feel, when you, when you think of chanting your japa, how are you actually thinking and feeling about that practice? Yeah? So just start there. When you come to chant your japa, how do you think and feel about it? Is it something that you love to do? Is it a chore? Is it a burden? Is it something that you're inspired to do? Just start there. Just make a note. How do I honestly feel about chanting my japa? Yeah? Let's just start there. Just at your own reflection. How is, what's your emotional connotation or association with the chanting of the holy name in japa? Not kirtan, but japa specifically. You want to share something much? Oh yes, sure, yeah, sure. So yeah, I wanted to... You, would you like to begin, Marge? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh. Could everyone this... this one there. There's, there's a word. It, it's just one word. A challenge. Challenge, yeah. It's a challenge to increase the quality of my chanting in such a way that I can connect more with Krishna. Wonderful. So I see it as a challenge. Wonderful. But, but it's wonderful that you, because when, the way you say it, it's clear that there's a deep, you're very, there's a, love, there's a loving desire. I can see the blocks that I have to challenge and I have to get over. So for me, I look at it as a, as a challenge to get over those blocks. Okay. Thank you for sharing that, Marge. Yes, can you pass the microphone over? Over to this side, please. I mean, if you want to share, that's fine. I'm not going to, no one's going to be forced to, but for those who want to, that's fine. Um, as you asked us to reflect, I just sort of went inside. And the first thing that came to my mind is that my job is my, job is my safety net, my safety zone. It's something I turn to when I'm distressed or nervous or anything and uh, to me it's like the the um, anchor for the day if I if I don't chant I don't know what will happen to me you know I'll probably go more crazy than I already am <laughs> so to me it's my safety safety zone okay thank you how many oh yeah one more please and I will ask another question uh, so Many times I, I feel that I uh, consider my japa as, as duty, and I know it's it's not good. It's very uh, very much uh, not good, but uh, from time to time I can manage to approach it as service, mm -hmm. because uh, once I heard in a class that uh, chanting uh, in front of uh, Radeshyam deities is worship, but when we are chanting in front of Gornita, it's service, and uh, and for me it. Uh, it gave a lot because uh, when I can approach it as service, I can have the mood of pleasing uh, Krishna. But uh, actually, I need uh, good circumstances uh, around me to to be able to do that. Okay, thank you. So what I'm going to ask is, just a show of hands, when you thought about this in terms of the chanting, how many of you found that your reflection was somewhat maybe negative, honestly? Okay, very interesting, very interesting. So we see what, what we've been saying. So for many of us, we've created unwittingly or ne not necessarily deliberately some negative association to the chanting. This entire thing can be reversed. That's the first thing. The entire thing can be reversed. Let's look at one way to do this. So I'm going to read, read one of these prayers that Marge gave. We're going to read it very slowly. I'm going to read, I'm going to ask you to repeat, and then I'm going to ask you what, this is, what, what is being said in this, in this particular prayer. So, let's start here. 
and, and I'm going to ask you to do this reflectively and meditatively. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. So just really listen. Please just listen to what's being said. Nama chintamani rupam. Repeat, please. Nameva paramagati. Nameva paramagati. Namna parataram nasti. Namna parataram nasti. Tasmanama upasmahe. Tasmanama upasmahe. Okay, so let's look at this bit by bit. So here the translation is. The holy name is a beautiful, transcendental touchstone. So let's just stop there. I'll repeat this. The holy name is a beautiful, transcendental touchstone. So what, is, what, what do you hear? What is being said in this verse about the holy name? What does that mean? Let's start there. Can you pass the mic? We'll start on this side. We're just going to do this meditatively because rather than just go through lots of information, a few things and go deep with it. What is being said? Uh, the, the holy name fulfills all desires. Okay. It's a beautiful touchstone. It fulfills all desires. Anyone else? What is being said in this particular verse? Any phenomena, if it becomes touched by the holy name, it becomes something different. Okay. So the holy something name... Could, better, yep. Something better. Something more It makes blissful. everything auspicious. Good. What else? Yes. Best of everything. It's the best of everything. Okay, now let's pause for one second. So, what we read is, the holy name is a beautiful, transcendental touchstone. Now, understanding that, what, what does that inspire in you in regards to the holy name? If we accept that it's a beautiful, transcendental touchstone, what feelings are evoked by understanding that? Can you pass the microphone here? What feelings are evoked by understanding this? Okay. Uh, for me, it, it means that it, it's beautiful, so it uh, it uh, mm, attracts the mind. Okay. So it means it attracts the mind. If you could pass it back to so what's being said? The holy name is a beautiful, transcendental touchstone. It's hope giving, so it can work even for me. Okay. So it's hope giving. It can give. It can give benefits to all of us. Thank you. One more. The holy name is a beautiful, transcendental touchstone. Just listen to the words. So, because the holy name is wish-fulfilling, to me, it says that I can give you Krishna. And it is not different. Thank you. If we could pass it to Maharaj, the microphone, please. We want to hear. The holy name is a beautiful, transcendental touchstone. Uh, the first thought that came to my mind was not so much about what you have been saying, but how it how it affects me. Yeah. And what I was thinking is that I have been given a very special, rare gift. And so there's a sense of gratitude, sense of appreciation for what I've been given. Thank you, Marge. Yeah. And this is exactly the point. This is, this is one of the key things to bear in mind. When we read our scriptures, it's meant to be deeply reflected on. When it's deeply reflected on, as, as Marge gave the example, you will feel something because you will understand more about what you've been given. And the more that we feel something, the more it leaves an impression, a positive impression, and the inspiration to take that gift and to use it properly. Okay? And this is just one part of this prayer. His Holiness Sachin Elmaj would often say that the difficulty in our movement is we've heard so much, but we've reflected on very little. So it's like you had all these classes, and then you turn away and go back and everyone does the same thing. But if we follow these four stages, it is actually a transformative Krishna consciousness. If you just hear, it's beneficial. Because it's purifying in of itself. But if you hear and reflect on it, it goes deeper. If you hear, reflect, and then apply it, it goes even deeper. If you hear, reflect, apply, and pray for mercy, then you're, even, you're moved even further along the journey. 
Okay? So, so what we're trying to encourage is depth as opposed to quantity. Yeah? So in our spiritual life, you can take even one verse like this and keep meditating on it, meditating on it, thinking about what does this mean for me? What is being said by our acharyas? What, is, what are they telling me about the holy name? So it is said that in the Shikshashikam, the different verses relate to different stages of spiritual advancement. And the first verse, Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtanam, it explains the opulences of the holy name. And our acharyas have explained that that first verse relates to Shraddha. And it's interesting how they explain the connection. They explain that by understanding the benefits of the holy name, it gives one the faith to chant. Because you understand how great and how auspicious this is, and all the wonderful things that will come by the chanting. Yeah? Now it's very interesting also the Goswamis have, have explained that faith gives two things, virya and smriti. Virya means drive or determination, smriti means remembrance. So think about that. If we understand these verses properly, our determination to chant, our inspiration to chant actually becomes stronger. Hmm? But it's not about so many things, but take the teachings, even a part of it, and go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Let's take another line of this. So I'll read the first part and, and go further. The holy name is a beautiful, interesting word to use, a beautiful transcendental touchstone. It is the supreme goal. Okay. It is the supreme goal. What do you understand by this? The Holy Name is a beautiful transcendental touchstone. It is the supreme goal. If we could pass the microphone. It's blind. Okay. If we chant, um, we don't chant to reach a goal. We chant because we have reached okay. the goal. Okay, good. Now let's just take that a step further. If the holy name is not to reach a goal, but if the holy name is a goal, if, if we really deeply accept that, how will that change our, our chanting? If I accept that the holy name is the goal, rather than the means to something else, how will it affect my chanting? Attentive. What else? Prioritizing it, satisfying. <clears throat> yes, because there's nowhere else to go. It's not that you do it, as Mara just saying, it's not that you do it so you can get to something else. But this is the highest activity that we're doing. It is interesting. You, you can actually tell what the members of our movement believe about our, about our process by what they do. What we read in the class is one thing, but what people believe is demonstrated by what they do. So in many cases, we don't believe it's the supreme goal, which is why it becomes something else while we run into something else. You see, and again, by the meditating on this, we can rectify that. Let me take it a step further. The holy name is a beautiful transcendental touchstone. It is the supreme goal. There is nothing higher than the holy name. Isn't that interesting? I mean, just in this one verse, it is like, it, it is a sutra, literally. It is packed with meaning and deep realization. There is nothing, I repeat, there is nothing higher than the holy name. What are, you, what are you hearing when you hear this? There is nothing, you can just shout out, don't worry about the microphone, otherwise it will take time. Second, and the Holy Name is first. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. 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 please. I guess the requires some explanation. Like, as it says in Nam. In Srila Rupa Goswami's prayer, Namastaki, he says that of Nam and Nami, yes. the name and one who is being named. The name is higher because it has the element of mercy. So if you commit offense against one who is being named, it's only the name that can relieve you from that offense. Mm -hmm. So there's an element of mercy that's in the name that is not necessarily found 
in our connection with Krishna in other any other forms. Thank you very much. Yeah. And just to kind of round off, because it's nine o'clock, and I promised I would, I would stop on time. But just let me just—I just want to pause you and just close this off. How does it feel to take to take this approach? Do you feel that it's a different approach to the way that we normally look at the teachings? Yeah, it's one part of it, but then you go deeper and deeper and deeper, and you can do this individually or reflecting with a friend. But we want to encourage you for the for your entire spiritual life. We've actually heard so much, but our problem is that we've not digested. We've, we've digested hardly anything. Yeah. So with these teachings on the holy name in particular. We encourage you, take a little bit and be reflective. What are you being told about the Holy Name? And the more that we reflect on it, the more it's going to leave a deeper impression in our consciousness. And the proof of that is we will start to see ourselves move, move more towards the Holy Name in our spiritual journey. Really, the rest of the, of the slides was just going to look at some of the different approaches. And I know Marge knows of these. For example, just focusing on one mantra at a time like that so what we did for the, the, the slide exercises was one is just ch chanting one mantra at a time and then stopping for a moment and just reflecting how does that feel when I chant this and let me write down what are my realizations when I take this approach yeah one activity was going to be Prabhupada made the, they made the comment just try to hear yourself chant sincerely okay so you actually practice this as a meditation I chant and I try to hear myself sincerely chanting what does that feel like? And again, you stop. This is not, this is not the normal japa that we do. This is meditative, real mantra meditation. And you stop and you, and you just think, how did that feel when I chant like this? When I, when I do this, what was the experiences? Another approach would be using the, the prayers that Marge gave. I used these this morning. It was wonderful. To be honest, it was absolutely wonderful. Very, very blissful. You know? And so, just when I do these prayers, but, but most of all behind this, the truth of the matter is, we want to encourage you to try and chant in the mode of goodness. Try and create a space in your life so when you're chanting, it's not, it's not a chore, it's not stressful. It's not, I've got to get this done because I've got a million and other things to do. You will know what's going to make that work. But we want to encourage you, make a space in your life so you can actually do your chanting and it's not painful, it's not negative. Because the more that you do that, the more that you will be able to experience everything that the scriptures are saying about the Holy Name. Okay? So the journey is to create that space and to try the different teachings of our Acharyas about the Holy Name. Bhakti Notarko says, when you're chanting, you can be before the deity and look at the beautiful form of the deity while you're chanting. It will work in different ways for different people. But look for what's going to help you to be absorbed in the chanting. The more that you find the personal approach that really inspires and energizes you to be absorbed in your chanting, then your spiritual life can really take off with taste. Yeah? So for work, what we do is I, I work with leaders and managers, and I often ask them, what keeps you energized in your, in your role as a leader? So we are going to ask you something similar. Where do you gain your inspiration to chant? What keeps you energized and inspired in the process of chanting? Because if you are able to pinpoint these things and do more of them and do it often, you've just tapped into a great source of inspiration and energy that can keep helping you in your journey towards the Holy Name. Okay? Okay. So forgive me for going over because I promised that Mataji came to me early and said I should because they need to organize for the sacra for, for the yagya for the initiations but did you get the main point yeah so there's two things one is the main thing about what helps you and two let's do our, let's do our spiritual life properly let us make it an actual meditation so it's something that we relish and go deep with and it does require some sacrifice in some cases we're going to have to move some ways of the, some part of our lifestyle around to be very honest because for some of us, our lifestyle is so stressful and in the mode of passion and ignorance, to, you won't be able to chant properly. Yeah? And it's no, if I'm, I, I've also been in that situation. I completely know what it's like. But we've we got to try and move in that direction. It cannot, 
if it, the chanting is done properly, it will displace other things, actually. If the chanting is done properly, you will actually start to adjust other areas of your life because you want to chant properly. That's a sign that we're moving towards the goal in the proper way. Yeah? So, anyway, again, forgive me for going over, but we're going to stop there because otherwise I'll be in trouble. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Sri Nam Prabhu Ki Jai. Sri Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gaurav Bhaktivrinda Ki Jai. Jai Nita Gaurav Pramanandi Hari Hari Yeah. Who wrote this prayer? Sorry? Who wrote this prayer? Marge, I, to be honest, I don't know. I'll see. Sachin and Marge gave me this prayer, but they didn't have the... Um, huh? Sorry, I gave it away. No, no, no. Assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. So we're going to go a bit further along the journey that we began this morning. Um... How many of you were not here in the morning, for morning class? I just want a show of hands. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll begin by recapping some of the things that we discussed. So we're all up to speed and go forward from there. So we began this morning by reading Bhagavad Gita, chapter 10, text number 25. In that particular verse, Krishna is talking about many things, but he says, of sacrifices... I am the chanting of the holy names, Japa. And in the purple, Prabhupada is speaking about how the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the pure, um, purest representation of Krishna. It is non different from Krishna. So then we started to look a little bit, and I want us to go into this discussion a bit more. And, and I think we should make it very much interactive. Maybe. I'm conscious also that when we use the, the microphone, it may slow, slow things down. So what we'll try and do is we'll try and do this without the microphone. But what I'm going to ask you to do is speak nice and loud so that everyone can hear you. And the reason why we're going to take this approach is based upon a premise that we shared this morning. And that is that as an international society for Krishna consciousness, we hear so much. And that is wonderful. But we, we want to take it as deeply as possible. And one of the ways in which we are, we're meant to take it deeply is to really follow through on some of the stages which are given in our literatures. It, it is a fact that within our movement, often we don't really understand what we've been given. And because we don't understand what we've been given, we don't really value it properly. And, and these four stages are just one simple example. So one Prabhupada disciple who was interacting with educationalists in the outside world, he shared with them these four, four stages. So Shravana, that we begin by hearing knowledge. Manana, what we hear, we really take the time to reflect upon that. Nididhyasana, once we've reflected upon it, we start to pull it into practice. We start to tangibly do something, act on what we've learned. And Vandanam, Vandana means prayer. So we understand the first three stages are around our endeavor. We're making an endeavor to connect with the teachings of Krishna through hearing, meditating on Krishna's teachings, and pulling Krishna's teachings into our own practice. But the fourth stage is really calling upon the Lord for mercy. I'm going to make the endeavor, but unless you give me your mercy, I will not be able to be perfect in what, in what I'm trying to do. Because what I'm trying to do is to develop or rediscover my dormant, loving relationship with you. So it's a relationship. That means that there are two people involved in that relationship. We can, we can try to pursue Krishna, try to engage in a relationship with Krishna, but he has to, by his own sweet will, reciprocate with that relationship. So when this devotee was sharing these four stages with these educationalists, they were flabbergasted. They said it's a brilliant framework for education. <coughs> the reason why it's a brilliant framework for education is because when we, when we act in our spiritual life in this way, it is increasingly transformative. How many of you in this room know a devotee or know devotees who have been practicing for, this, for a long time and they haven't really changed much? Anyone know devotees like that? Okay. Anyone know devotees who you think are a bit stuck 
in their spiritual life. Be honest. Okay. It's actually good, because if I ask this question in London, a lot more hands go up, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, to be really honest. But it can happen. And there are a number of reasons. One of them is that we often fail to digest the philosophy. And through these four stages, we're meant to digest the philosophy. Then we also mentioned this morning how Krishna consciousness is really a mission. It's a missionary activity as well. The mission of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is to spread the teachings of Krishna consciousness to every town and to every village. So there's a lot of activity. But with the activity, there also must be depth. And sometimes we have a culture where it can be easier to run around doing things than to actually really develop your Krishna consciousness, internalizing it. Yeah? So sometimes it's easier to do that, and you can get all the prestige from the devotees. Oh my God, they've done this, they've done that, they've done this, they've done that. But at the end of the day, when we look at our level of Krishna consciousness, it may not be so strong. So what we then wanted to do, and what we were doing with, the, um, with one of the prayers that Marge shared with us yesterday, was we were doing a prayerful reading. Just like if you want to relish a meal, you take one, one mouthful after the other, but you don't just throw it into your mouth and swallow. You take it. In, in ancient cultures, this was what was done. In ancient cultures, there was no such thing as eating food. It was really about honoring the Lord's grace. So the activity was done in a very meditative state. The person would sit down properly, make sure that they're calm and peaceful. There would be no disturbing discussions at lunchtime because it was understood that when you have talks on very disturbing subject matter, it also affects the digestion. And then in that meditative state, the food will be served very nicely in a very sattvic environment. And then one, very peacefully, bit by bit, is honoring the remnants of Krishna's own plate. And Prabhupada would often do that as well. He would sit in that space and just really relish Krishna in the form of prasadam. But Krishna's prasadam is everywhere because everything in this movement is a, is a manifestation of Krishna's mercy. So in a similar way that we do that with the food or with the, yeah, with the foodstuffs which have been offered, we can do that with our philosophy. Yeah? We can take it bit by bit and really digest it. What is Prabhupada saying? What is Krishna saying? How do I understand this? How do I apply this in my own life? And the more that we do that, the more depth we have in our Krishna consciousness. The more depth, and also the more transformation that we can experience in our Krishna consciousness as well. So there was one particular verse that we were using this morning, which I will bring out. And we were going through that verse step by step, just to read through and, and, and to really meditate on what is actually being given to me by our teachings. Because the idea being that it, the verse was like a sutra. A sutra is almost like, it's like wisdom that's packed up into one really short seed-like form. And then by your concentration, the seed is starting to blossom and unfold. And everything that was packed up in the seed starts to unfold before us. And the idea is that when we do this with our teachings, we can have tremendously greater depth in our Krishna consciousness. Okay, so this was some of the ideas. We also talked about the fact that for many of us as devotees, the way that we live Krishna consciousness is often in, in the mode of passion or the mode of ignorance. We gave the example of one person who was born in the movement. Well, this is a slightly different point, but we also talked about one person who was born in the movement. And when they would do something wrong as a young boy, his punishment was that the parents would tell him, go and stand in the corner and chant Hare Krishna. Yeah, so very unfortunate. So as a result, he has 
well, the situation has created what we call a negative emotional trigger for that person. Whenever he reaches for his bead bag, it's that negative experience. It's that experience of shame, correction, chastisement, and then we're trying to get that person to feel inspired in their chanting of the holy names of Krishna. Now, that's an extreme example. But, many devotees have that, have that challenge. Because of how we've positioned the name in relation to our life. Okay? And we ask devotees, just a, a show of hands, we ask devotees, when you, when you come to chanting your japa, how do you feel, or what comes to mind? And for many devotees, it was maybe a bit of stress, something I've got to do, you know, so different emotions and different experiences. But we also shared how ultimately, the Holy Name is blissful. So what we're trying to do in our practice of Krishna consciousness is to uncover the Holy Name in its pure form. To reconnect with the Holy Name as it truly is. And, and we, we were having just a Q&A before the class. So there are also quite a few devotees here, are new or young. So it's also a very, a very um, it's a good opportunity to protect your chanting. To protect it with very good habits so that these things don't become an obstacle in the first place. Okay? So, what we also discussed this morning, and where we're going to take this class is that we all come in with different types of karma because we've all had different previous lives. We all come in with different types of natures, different mentalities. And that's a blessing, but it can also be a challenge for the devotees. Because when we're in community with devotees, everyone has a unique nature, personality. What's easy for one person may be very difficult for the other person. And because we're very unique individuals, we may not understand each other. Why do they have to be like this? Why does she have to do that all the time? Why can't she be more like me? Why does Prabhu have to do this? Why, does, why doesn't he behave like this? And this can be the source of sometimes conflict or misunderstanding amongst devotees. Ultimately, Prabhupada says, Atma Dhammanya He says, everyone sees the world from their own perspective. Now the other side of that, is that because we are individuals, different things will enliven us, especially as we come forward in our chanting of the Holy Names. And what we wanted to do for this session is, be, is take a step on a journey. And that is the step on the journey of finding out what things help me to be absorbed in my spiritual practice of chanting. Okay? Our Acharyas have given an extraordinary range of teachings, different techniques and different practices that can help us to move forward on the journey. That's a great blessing, but it can also be, be overwhelming. Because we may sometimes think there's so many different things I can do, but an otaku says this, and then another, you know, one of the Goswami says this, and then someone else says this, and there's this prayer, there's that prayer, there's this to read, there's that to read. Where do I begin? In one sense, it's really ultimately about what's going to inspire us. So we wanted to have a few, we wanted you to do a few interactive things, a few practices to get a feel for different things, but this time in a very meditative and reflective way. So we're going to try a few different approaches to chanting. We're going to start though with a guided meditation. Okay? And this guided meditation, anyway, I'll do it, and then I'm going to ask you a few questions about what you experienced also afterwards, because you may find this quite interesting. So, before we start chanting, I'm going to ask everyone to sit up straight. Okay. And then I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm just going to ask you just to spend some time just with your eyes closed and just allow yourself to relax a bit. Allow any 
challenges, any tension, any stress from the day to just gently, just gently fall down through your body, out through the ground and away from you once and for all. Just let yourself relax. Give your body permission to relax even more. And just feel yourself calm, more peaceful. And just allow yourself to be centered in that space of relaxation and calm. And what we're going to do in this exercise is we're going to we're going to go on a journey. And this first stage of the journey is just to just to reflect in this world we have a certain body. In this world the body has a certain age, it has a certain gender, the body has a certain nationality, ethnicity. But for the duration of this exercise, what I'd like you to do is just recognize this truth, this truth that has been given to us through the pages of the Bhagavad Gita. The first truth that Krishna gives to Arjuna is that even though you have a body, even though you have a physical body, this body isn't us. It is something that we're carrying in this world. So for the duration of this exercise, I just want to let you, encourage you to just park the body. For the duration of this exercise, we're going to leave the body and we're going to go further on our journey. Okay? So, just let the bodily identification just loosen up, relax, and however you visualize it, let the bodily identification fall away. So from now, we're not this physical body at all. For the duration of this exercise, allow yourself to be in that space that you're not the body. And because you're not the body, you have no responsibilities as a man, father, protector, no responsibilities as a woman, mother, wife, for the duration of this meditation, just let any and all bodily identifications just fall away. Just fall away. And then we're going to take it a step further. We have a mind. We have a certain type of material identity. Material ego. But again, for the duration of this exercise, I want you to consider that even this conditioned personality that I use in the world, who has certain desires, certain fears, fears, certain concerns, for the duration of this exercise, we're going to ask you just to let that go. So we're not the body. We're also going to let go of any identification with the mind. Just completely loosen, relax, and let go of any and all physical and mental identities. And I'm going to ask you to connect with the deepest understanding that in this room each and every one of us are exclusively and therefore I mean only 
an eternal servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So I just want you to let yourself settle in that identity. We've parked the bodily identification. We've let go of the mental, emotional, psychophysical identification. Just let them go. And we sit in this room exclusively as eternal servants of Krishna. So you want to allow yourself to be comfortable in that in that realization. And we're going to take it to the next step. I want you to allow yourself to reflect, to understand that there is someone in your heart, a supremely attractive person who loves you, who knows you completely and who's always been with you and seen your successes, your challenges and is always intensely longing to bring you back to him to a place in life where you are intensely happy blissful I want you to reflect on that supreme Krishna in the heart and I want you to reflect on the time that he came through for you a time where you needed help you needed something and he arranged it he helped you in some way, shape or form. And I want you to connect again with how it felt when you remembered how Krishna had reached out to you and helped you, protected you, gave you some kind of insight or blessing. And I just want you to connect back again with that time. And I want you to connect with whatever positive feelings that were in your heart when you remember how Krishna lovingly touched your life, lovingly manifested to help you in some way, shape or form. And as you connect with that, reconnecting with that positive feelings, whatever they were, whether it was gratitude, whether it was appreciation, whether it was wonder, whether it was amazement, whatever you felt at that time, when you realize, my God, Krishna's helping me, or Krishna's done something, Krishna's arranged this. And we all have those sweet moments in our life where some kind of Krishna miracle happened. And I want you, as you think about this, and as you reflect on this, at the count of three, I'm going to ask you to chant Krishna's names, but this time connecting with that feeling, that remembrance that's alive in your heart. And we're going to do this for a few minutes and then we're going to move on to the next thing. So after three, I'm going to ask you to chant, but this time your chanting is going to be connected with the feelings that you hold in your heart personal feelings based upon a personal reciprocation that you experience from the supreme personality of Godhead. I'm going to ask you to chant based upon the personal feelings that you have for Krishna, based upon the personal way in which he reached out to you, helped you and showed his affection and presence to you. And we'll chant for a few minutes and then we'll reconvene at the count of three. One, two, three. Please chant. <laughs> Keep your eyes closed and keep connected to that feeling that you have for Krishna. Remembering how Krishna really helped you personally. 
something he did for you personally. And based upon that, chant his names with the feelings that you have for him, based upon how he came into your life and helped you. Stay connected to your feelings for Krishna based upon your personal reciprocation from Krishna. Chant from your heart based upon your personal feelings for Krishna. Chant from your heart based upon your personal feelings for Krishna, based upon your personal experiences with Krishna and the way that he helped you, the way that he showed his, his kindness, his affection and his love for you and chant with that feeling. Chant from your heart, chant in remembrance of that wonderful association, how Krishna personally cared for you and showed his affection for you. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to finish. At the count of three, I'm going to ask you to finish that round, that mantra, and then we're going to do something a bit further on. So after three, I'm going to ask you to finish. One, two, three. Stay in the meditative space. Stay in that meditative space and just reflect on what you did. Reflect on how it felt to chant Krishna's names, but with, with, with a sense of feeling for Krishna and a feeling which was based upon some real experience, some real way in which Krishna touched your life and touched your heart. Okay? So just stay in the meditative space and just reflect. How did that feel? How did that feel when I chanted Krishna's names but in remembrance of some wonderful affection that he had given or shown me? How did that feel when I chanted in that way? Okay. 
and I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. And what I'm going to ask you to do, and I'm just going to give you about, let's say, two to three minutes to do this, I want you to turn to someone who's sitting next to you. And I want you to share two things. I want you to share what was the experience that you recalled, that where Krishna had come and, and given, shown you some care, some reciprocation, some affection. So share that. And that's the first thing. And the second thing is how did it feel to chant in that way? How did it feel to chant when you were reconnecting with Krishna in that mood of gratitude or that mood of connection from the heart? So just share the answer to these two questions with someone next to you, the men on the, with the men's side, the women on the women's side. We'll give you two to three minutes and then I'm going to take it to a next step. Two to three minutes over to you.
Hare Krishna. Okay, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask everyone to refocus again, please. So, let's look into this. So we did a few things. First of all, we did a meditation that helped us to let go of what we sometimes call the upadis, the different identifications of the body. Then we focused in on the fact that we are only exclusively a servant of Krishna. Then we asked you to reflect on the time that Krishna had personally reciprocated with you in some way, shape or form. And we all had those experiences. There was some situation or you had some difficulty, you needed something and suddenly it just appeared, whatever it is. Then we asked you to chant from that space. First of all, was that, is that the way that we normally chant as devotees? No. Okay. That's the first realization. But we want, to discuss, we want to discuss this, we want to churn this a bit. Because again, this, there's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, those who explain the supreme secret to my devotees, they are the most dear to me. So everyone here is a devotee. Confirmation. <laughs> everyone here is a devotee. So we're going to share with each other. When you, when you chanted in this way, how did it feel? Let's start there. What was your experience? Okay, calm, peaceful. Anyone else? More grateful. more grateful. Why more grateful? Because Krishna has repeated so many times, it just. Yeah. Sometimes the way that the material energy is, we can forget how many times Krishna's helped us. How many situations. But one of the ways in which we can deepen that remembrance is this reflection. And if we reflect on how He's come through for me in so many ways, shapes, or forms, and then we chant, it can as you said, increase the gratitude. You mentioned it was peaceful as well. What else did you experience when you were chanting in this way? So we began by reflecting. It wasn't something new. We're not asking to have a new experience. This is your experience of your life and how Krishna's come through for you on many occasions. Many occasions. Then we said, okay, remember that and now chant. What was different? More focused. More focused. Why was it more focused? Mind was not interfering with the holy name. Yeah. Yeah. The other, the other reason why the mind didn't interfere with the holy name is because we got you into a bit of a calm space before you chanted. And this goes back to what was being said earlier. If our lifestyle is too stressful, what happens is I'm stressed and now I'm trying to focus. Ideally, that's especially why the morning hours are so good, it's meant to be before you start thinking about all the other things that you have to do. Make sense? Yeah? So the point is that whenever we create a space where the mind's a bit more peaceful, then when you chant, you can really focus. Because the mind isn't disturbed thinking about all these other things. Okay? So just as one takeaway, try to think, how can I create that space inside so that when I'm chanting, I'm not disturbed by all these other things I've got to do and if I don't get it done, oh my God, I've got a job, I've got this to do. How do I create that space in my life so when I sit down, I remember, I'm not my job, I'm not anything else, I'm just a servant of Krishna. How else did you, what other benefits did you get when you chanted in this way? We're going to go in the, drill into it a bit more. What other, what other difference did you feel when you chanted, having created a, a peaceful space and remembering, I'm chanting and I'm calling upon the person who's really been kind to me and helped me out again and again and again in my life? Any other experiences that you had? Yes? Faith increased. Your faith increased. Why did it increase? Because the relationship is Yeah. So there's one principle of chanting, um, it's sometimes called chanting in Sambandha. So what you practice was chanting in Sambandha, because you remembered the relationship before you started the practice of the chanting. Yeah? So, very, very interesting, simple thing you can do even before you're chanting, just remember, who am I chanting to? It's not the Supreme Personality of God, it is not a philosophy. The Supreme Personality of God, it is a person. And that person has actually done a lot for each and every one of us. Yeah? That name, that name is also a person who's constantly giving, constantly kind. But if we don't remember, then we chant in a different way. But when we remember, 
it changes the practice. Okay? Okay. We're going to do another practice. It's almost 10 minutes to... Oh, no, we won't do another practice because I promised I'd finish at 5 o'clock. <laughs> it's okay, we'll do, we'll do something different. I, I was fast forward it. But you get the sense. But the, the last thing I want to do actually captures a few things together. And so this is an exercise that was um, practiced, which was done in a Japa retreat. Very simple exercise, but very effective. And to do this exercise, I'm going to, I'm going to give an example. I'm going to ask Prabhu, what's your name? Mahaprabhu Gora. I'm going to ask you if you don't mind to stand up and come to the front. Okay. So this last exercise is based upon the fact that we all have, we all actually, if we're very honest with ourselves, we know what we're doing well in our chanting. And if we're very honest with ourselves, we know where, where we're, we're struggling or making mistakes in our chanting. So for this exercise, and I, you, have to, you have to follow this very carefully, otherwise you may be a little bit confused about this exercise, okay? So in this exercise, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to pair up with someone, okay? I'm going to ask you to get into pairs. Okay. And then, like for example, Mahaprabhu Gora. So I'm pairing up with Mahaprabhu Gora. And we're going to do two five-minute pair, um, five-minute exercises. Same exercise, but five minutes. So for the first exercise, one. So let's say I'm person A. Okay. So I'm person A. Mahaprabhu Gora is person B. Okay. For the exercise, I'm going to pre pretend to be him. Right. So if I'm pretending to be him, what's my name? Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu Gora. Good. <laughs> right. Yes. And Mahaprabhu Gora is going to take the position of the holy name just for this exercise so then Mahaprabhu Gora is going to ask the holy name dear holy name please help me what am I doing well in my chanting and also what can I do to improve my chanting what do you want what do you want me to do what should I be doing to come closer to you and develop my relationship with you okay so I will take the position of my partner, my partner the first time, there's two rounds, so first time I will take the position of my partner, my partner will take the position of the holy name. So then Mahaprabhu Gora is asking the holy name, what do I need to do to improve? And then the holy name is going to tell Mahaprabhu Gora whatever he understands I need to be working on, okay? So the second time Mahaprabhu Gora will be who? Bhuta Bhavna. And Bhuta Bhavna will be who? The whole name. So when so you asked me how I can improve the relationship. Just do that? How can you improve the relationship? How can I improve the, my relationship with you? Yep, so he's asking the holy name. And I'll say Bhuta Bhavna. Well I see you doing well is I think that it's good that you're doing more seminars on the on the holy name because this will help you to understand better how to improve. I think you should do more of that. I also notice that you tend to chant later in the day. You need to change that habit. Because by doing that, it's actually holding you back from the relationship. Yeah? So it's actually an introspective exercise. It's based upon the fact that deep down, deep down, every single one of us, we actually you do know what you're doing well, and you actually do know what you need to change. Yeah? Now, it's one thing if someone else tells you, you hear it and say, yes, it's a nice class, let's go and have some prasadam. <laughs> but, it, but, but if you reflect on this yourself and you hear yourself saying that, it can have a different quality. Yeah? So the whole idea of this exercise and all these exercises, we're on this journey of transformation. Okay? So the idea is you're going to pair up. It'll be about three minutes each way. And please make it three minutes because otherwise I'll get in trouble. No, I'm joking. But, uh, yeah, but three minutes each way. But you pair up and three minutes one way. So first of all, Mahaprabhu Gora. Sorry, the holy name is telling Mahaprabhu Gora what he can do to improve. And then three minutes, the holy name is telling Bhuta Bhavana what he can do to improve. Is that, is that clear as an exercise first of all? Okay. So this is the last exercise, but before you start, one, more, one last thing. One last thing before you begin. When you do this, please listen, what, before you begin. When you do this, take it very seriously and be very, very honest.
be very honest in what you're sharing and anything that you hear make a mental note or write it down okay so whatever you learn from the exercise make a mental note or write it down and try to make one or two of those changes to bring yourself into a closer relationship with the holy name okay over to you for the next six minutes Do If you haven't done so already, there's three minutes left, so there's a chance for you to switch to the other person. If we've got three minutes left. If you haven't done so, switch. Thank you very much.
я со здравым. Карьера мне здорово снимает. Так что ты ходишь через три здорово. Служба часом весь, він нам часом сміти звучити, поки учитка Розісандра Дина. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, so we're going to pause there. It's five o'clock, so we're going to end on time. But hopefully the exercise will have given you some insights into what you're doing well, and also some things that you can do to improve. And because you've heard yourself say it, you may have found that some interesting things came up as well that we could do. So think, what's, what's the change? What's something that I can do differently? Whether it's doing more of or less of that can help me in my relationship with the Holy Name. Okay, so we'll stop there. Thank you very much. Sri Nam Prabhu Ki Jai. Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai Nita Gopramnandi. Hari Hari Bo. Okay. Sri Prabhupada.